Hello, hello, landlord. This is Eric here with the Rem Prep for Landlords podcast, and we've had some rebroadcasts for about the last month, but I'm excited that we're back on it. And today we have a podcast. It's going to be me and Andrew Schultz. Uh, maybe you've heard Andrew before on the podcast. Uh, he's a property manager here in the Western New York area, really knowledgeable guy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the audio that I did from a interview where we talked about what to do after you've selected your tenant applicant. So you've gone through the entire tenant screening process. You think you've got the right person in place. And now what do you do? How do you make sure that utilities are changed over properly? How do you make sure that you don't get stuck with a bounce check? What kind of process and systems does Andrew have in place so that he can make it as smooth as possible getting that tenant into the rental property? Hope you enjoy this episode, and we look forward to making new episodes here in the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast, and now your hosts, Stephen White and Eric Worrell. Everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Property Manager here with Andrew Schultz of Realty Edge. Andrew uh, operates and manages 120 doors here in the Western New York area. He's an associate broker. And today we're having him on the show because we'd like Andrew to talk about his process of onboarding a new tenant. So at the point that you've found the perfect tenant you believe for your rental property and you want to make this person move into your rental property as smooth as possible, Andrew's going to talk about his process. So thank you for being on the show again, Andrew. Sure. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy doing these. Yeah. And I know I've mentioned this probably a thousand times before, but I just really appreciate Andrew's insights because you're able to do these things every day. So I've done, you know, maybe 10 move-ins in the last 10 years right. or nine years, I should say, and you're probably doing 10 a month, you know? So you just get that opportunity to constantly refine your process. And today that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So jumping into it, Andrew, what's the, uh, what's the first thing you do when you think you found that perfect tenant applicant? Where, where, you, where do you start? So once we think we have the perfect applicant, our first step is to call them and say, hey, congratulations, you know, you got the apartment. Um, we'll go through just verbally with them what the process looks like between acceptance of the application and move-in day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we tell them to watch their email because we send them an email. We have a template built out. So we send them an email that gives them a list of everything that needs to happen between, you know, point A and point B, when it needs to happen by you know, how funds need to be delivered, how to sign your lease, things like that. We've got it all kind of wrapped into a template that we've been using uh, with our tenants lately, and it seems to be working very well. Yeah, and that uh, template that you have, Andrew, you actually have written a uh, chapter in a uh, book that we're going to be releasing. Um, it's called The Rent Prep for Landlords, The uh, Landlord Water Cooler. And uh, we have that template, too, for people. So I'll include in the show notes of this uh, video or podcast, however you're hearing this, I'll include a link to that for you. Uh, so people can grab that as well. Uh, one of the interesting things, I think, with the way you do your process, and I think it's worth mentioning and kind of going backwards a step, is that you charge a $200 application fee. Can you kind of I explain do. why you do the 200 and then how do you handle that once you select your tenant applicant? So we went with the higher application fee because what it does is effectively takes that tenant off the market. They're no longer out looking for another apartment or something along those lines once they've put down a, a substantial deposit, a couple hundred dollars. And that's what we're using right now is 200. So what you're doing is effectively taking that person off the market. They're not out looking for other apartments while you make up your mind as to whether you want to accept or deny their application, which is nice. It puts the ball in your court, not in the tenant's court. So it works out pretty well. If the tenant's accepted, or if the applicant is accepted, I should say, we put their entire security or that entire $200 deposit right into their security. Uh, if they're not approved, we hold $50 per person that we had to run credit and background checks on, and then we refund the rest of it to them. Yeah, I like that because it's uh, kind of a nice benefit too if somebody does get selected for the uh, rental property that they didn't have to pay essentially for the background check, which is nice. Exactly, yeah, and I don't mind eating that. I mean, it's a, it's a small price to pay to have a good tenant in an apartment and you know, as long as we're as long as we're charging the people who are not being selected for theirs, really, it pretty much is a wash for us at the end of the day. Sure. So next steps, uh, you want to get certified funds and sign the lease. 
How do you go about this and why do you focus on getting certified funds as opposed to just getting a check or something of that nature? Sure. So in New York State, when you uh, go to move a tenant in, once they have possession of the apartment, um, if, say, a check bounces, they hand you a personal check and that check bounces, you don't find out for two weeks uh, after the check is bounced and suddenly you have a tenant who's living in your apartment that you now have to go through a full eviction process on to get them out. Mm -hmm. um, so we require for our application fee, uh, so the 200, and then the remainder of the security deposit and the first month's rent, all three of those payments need to be made to us in certified funds, either a bank check or a money order. So not to cut you off here, Andrew, but just kind of going back to the certified funds and making sure that you're getting your security deposit that way. I think it's really important and worth mentioning again, because if I had to guess, uh, a lot of landlords and maybe even some property managers kind of skip this step because it's pretty easy. You know, you want to hurry to get your tenant into that uh, rental property. And if you do skip this step, it's fine if the, you know you never have a check bounce, but then the moment that one does and you find that you're going through an eviction and maybe in your state that takes two months to go through, I mean, that's a pretty big issue just because you didn't want to get a certified check. No, you're right. And this this falls under the category of mistakes you only have to learn once. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had this happen. We had a tenant who bounced their first month's rent check. Their security check uh, cleared no problem, but they bounced their first month's rent check. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I ended up paying for an eviction process. I mean, I wasn't going to back charge the property owner for it. It's not their fault that I didn't, you know, that I didn't get certified funds, essentially. Sure. So I ended up paying for, you know, an eviction process and some lost rent and stuff like that and made an agreement with the client. So that's uh, that's how it all came about. I mean, most of the stuff that you'll find that's procedure in our office now is because you only have to make some mistakes one time before you uh, before you learn not to make them again. And that's that's definitely one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Money is a pretty good teacher in a lot of ways. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So as far as them signing the lease, let's say hypothetically they're moving in on November 1st. Like typically, mm -hmm. like what kind of time frame are you looking at having them sign the lease like before that? So I like to have my my lease signed and my security deposit in full within three days of me telling them that their application's approved. Mm -hmm. um, if it's you know if there's a weekend or a holiday or something in there, I, I might extend it a little bit. I don't like to stretch it out. Um, I like to get a lease signed right away so that I know that number one, I have a tenant. Number two, the tenant knows they have a place to live. And number three, that gives us you know time to talk to the property owner, coordinate any last minute work that needs to be done, or anything along those lines. Okay. Um, moving along, uh, the next step I have here highlighted, actually, I'm reading through your uh, chapter you wrote for us. It makes a nice uh, outline for this conversation. But the uh, having the tenant set up the utilities. Uh, I know we've spoken about this before a little bit as far as a, um, what is it called, a uh, landlord account for your utilities, the leave on yeah. landlord? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Western New York, with us having like the, the harsher winters and stuff like that, the utility companies, both gas and electric, um, they offer what's called a leave on for landlord account. So when the old tenant disconnects their service, it just rolls on into the landlord's name or into the property management company's name, however you want to bill it, mm -hmm. basically. But you don't wind up with a lapse of service, which is important. You don't wind up with frozen pipes, uh, burst pipes, broken everything, you know, flooded apartments, things like that. It's, it's pretty important to do that. Uh, and then what we do is we require any incoming tenant to have their utility account set up by the day of move-in, the morning of move-in, we call the utility companies to verify that the accounts have been switched into the tenant's name. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that for electric and for gas, uh, which are the two main utilities up here is electric and gas. We don't have a lot of propane and stuff unless you get out into the country. So, um, But the electric and gas, we're pretty, we're pretty strict on that. Um, and if somebody doesn't have their electric and gas switched over, they don't move in that day. Um, it's in the letter. It's outlined. We tell them not to wait until the last minute. Sometimes the utility companies will require a copy of the lease or something like that, mm. which we'll gladly send on the tenant's behalf. I have no problem with that. Uh, it takes us five seconds and it saves the tenant some headaches. It's good good tenant relations. Uh, but if they wait until the last minute, a lot of times they wind up missing their move-in date because they don't have the utilities on. And it's that's one of those situations where it turns into a too bad, we told you sure. and you didn't listen. So it's it also says a lot about the tenant up front too. So. Yeah, and I'd imagine it just kind of... Um it helps you kind of avoid just an awkward conversation. I mean, your tenants, you right. know, if you're somebody who doesn't have this policy in place and it's the second day of them living there and they're on your utilities and you're already having to like 
do I breach this conversation with them or do I hope they change right. it over? And like, what a horrible way to kind of start off the relationship, you know? Yeah, it, exactly. It's easier just to make sure that the tenants have it in their name um, before they take possession of the unit. And if they don't, then they don't move in. It's that simple. That's actually, we just had to ha happen this week. We had a tenant that uh, didn't get the utility switched over. And uh, as a result, they wound up not moving in on time. So and it created some headaches for them because they already arranged for a moving truck and this and that and the other thing. Okay. It just is what it is. Yep. Uh, regarding water bills, though, we always leave water in the property owner's name mm -hmm. or in the property management company's name. And we have that billed to our office, even on single families where tenants are responsible for the rent. And the reason we do that is water is a leanable bill in western New and most i think every municipality in western new york um basically meaning if the water bill doesn't get paid it turns into a lien against your property and then your property winds up on the auction block for something as stupid as a couple hundred dollars worth of water it's easier for us to receive that bill mm. pay that bill in our office and bill it back out to the tenant just so we don't wind up with a situation like that so we always leave the leave the water bill in either our name or the property owner's name and have it sent here and then we just back bill the tenant for it. Uh, so do you think that I'm foolish for just paying the water bill for my rental property? Is it a single? Uh, it's a duplex. Yeah, then, I mean, if it's a duplex, you're going to wind up paying the water on it. You just kind of factor it into your yeah. to your monthly uh, your monthly rental costs. Yeah, that was just uh, a selfish question for my, my own that's, gain. There. That's in Buffalo, right? Yeah, yeah. That's definitely one of the, I, this, you know, as well as I do, the city auctions right around the corner the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of property out there for that exact reason. It was a huge media story. I think last year, or the year before where a bunch of properties went up because they had back water bills mm -hmm. and people weren't paying them. And, you know, it just turns into a giant mess. So yeah. save yourself the headache and just uh, have it billed to you directly. So moving forward. As far as the move-in inspection, I know we've uh, done some content on this before. When in the process do you do this, and how do you handle that with a tenant? Usually I do it the day before. Um, I like to have a lot of time to walk through the unit at my own pace, take photos, really think, give things a, a good look over. Um, and obviously you can refer people over to the video that we've done on that. That's a good piece of content. Mm -hmm. But I always take my time and date stamp photos and everything showing, you know, what day I was there and took the photos. Mm -hmm. Normally I'll do it the day before. Occasionally I'll do it the day of if I have, you know, a more open schedule that day or whatever. But yeah, we try to do it like I don't do it weeks before because uh, then the, if you go to court, they're going to say, well, why were these photos taken a month before the tenant moved sure. in? A lot of things could have changed in that time frame. I would say no more than a day or two before you should be doing the uh, movement inspections. And then I think one of the things that you do, which I like, uh, is you give the uh, tenant, uh, what is it, like a seven-day window to find any damages that maybe you didn't spot in the move-in inspection? Yeah. So what we do on move-in day is we meet with the tenant at the property to give them their keys and they do their move-in inspection. They walk through uh, and look for any damages. By that point, I've already filled in their sheet with any damages that I have noted um, so I can point it out to them and say, yep, I already have that damage. Yep, I already have that damage. Nope, I missed that one. Let me write it down and get a picture of it right now. And I'll snap the photo in front of them. Uh, and then we do give our tenants, it's written right into our lease. They have a seven-day window to report additional damages that they may not have missed or may not have noticed mm -hmm. uh, during that first day. You're always going to find little things after you move sure. in. Uh, so we always give tenants that that little bit of time to to let us know if there's any additional damages. We'll have them usually send us a photo of it. Um, if they can't send us a photo, then we'll go out and take a photo. Uh, but normally they're pretty good about sending a photo to our email. And I like that because that gives me a time and date stamped email as to when the damage was reported, as well as photos showing the damage. And I'll compare their photo to my photo and make sure that it wasn't something that they caused sure. in, in the process of moving furniture in or something like that. Very cool. So as far as the entire process, I think that takes us from the point that you've decided on your tenant applicant and then through the move-in day. Do you have any other kind of suggestions or anything you want to mention to a landlord or property manager that might be listening? Um, follow up with your tenant after they move in. Usually about a week after the tenant moves in, we'll give them a call or send them an email or a text message saying, hey, just wanted to check in, make sure everything was going well. Um, do you have any questions? Is there anything, you know, any damages that you want to report? Things like that. Just start it off on the right foot is so important. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times these landlord-tenant relationships become very adversarial, sure. uh, I guess would be the term I would want to use. Um, it, they don't have to be that way. They don't have to be your best friend. 
uh, but you should at least be able to to work with a tenant in a cordial business-like manner. And a lot of people seem to forget that, especially when it gets toward the end of the tenancy, uh, when you start looking at damages after a tenant has moved out or something like that. People start to, they lose it. They get too emotional. Sure. They have to remember, you know, this is a business, no matter if it's one unit, two units, 120 units, 380 units, 5,000 units. It's a business. You have to pull the emotion back out of it. Look at it for what it is, uh, you know, figure out what you need to do to get the job done and then get the job done. So that's that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Yeah, there are so many issues that kind of arise uh, being a landlord or a property manager that could just be handled by pulling a motion out and putting communication in, you know, it's yeah, just absolutely. They, and I know we've talked about this before, but yeah, we see stuff come up in the Facebook group where, you know, the best thing this person could do is just have a conversation with the applicant, you know, and well, I mean, it, it goes back to, I, I think we've discussed on another podcast, my two rules of business. The first one being the right thing is always the right mm-hmm. thing, which I stole from Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, and document, 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 which I think I stole from Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> uh, so it's it's very simple. As long as you document things and have a clear, you know, a clear idea of what's going on and that, you know, you know, your conversations with the tenants, I'm not saying you have to record every phone call with a tenant, but, you know, emails, text messages, that stuff is great. Um, time and date stamp photos, that's great. Uh, things like that. Just making sure that you're documenting well in case something comes up. You can go back and say, well, I remember talking to you about this at whatever time on whatever date. This is what we decided, blah, blah, blah. It just helps a lot. It's all about communicating and taking the uh, taking the emotion out of it a lot of times. Yeah, and speaking of documenting, I know you're actually in the process right now of documenting all of your process in your business, correct? We are, yeah. Actually, I spent uh, a good chunk of my Sunday just recording how our maintenance procedure works. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's lengthy. It's five pages because it covers everything from, um, you know, how to enter a work order, what information we're looking for, um, how to put it into our maintenance system, how to schedule it, how to make sure the contractors are doing the job right, invoicing, how we bill it back to the client. It's it's lengthy, but it's it's worthwhile. Once you have those procedures documented and you start going from you know two units to 10 units mm-hmm. to, to 50 units, other people are going to have to start taking on portions of the work. So spending the time to do that when you're – I wish I would have done this years ago, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. I feel like I'd be a lot further ahead if I had done this a long time yeah. ago. But once you document those processes, it makes it very easy for anybody to step in and help you. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a reason that McDonald's is able to franchise. There's a reason that when you buy a McDonald's franchise or Subway franchise, as a classic example, it comes with a three-ring binder that's like this thick of how to make a sub, mm-hmm. you know, how to how many slices of cheese and where do you put them and how much mayonnaise. All of that stuff, you know, it's number one, it's corporate recipe, but number two, it's 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 manual. It's it's standard operating mm-hmm. procedure. So that's huge in any business. Very cool. Well, I look forward to uh, making pieces of content in the future with you that kind of uh, revolve around some of that uh, process that you're uh, building right now in your own business. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, once again, Andrew, thank you for your time here today. And hopefully our listeners and people watching the video on our Facebook group are getting a lot of value out of these uh comment below or send us an email i'm eric at rem prep love to hear from you and uh yeah thanks again we really appreciate you taking the time to do these each week no problem thanks for having me i appreciate it